Um, I'm with, since we're running a little late, I'm going to zip through some of this mostly unimportant information. That's me. You can get a hold of me there. Here's the agenda. That's what we're going to do. Uh, 20 years, lead this, that, and the other thing, and a global team of developers. We'll get to the meat of this. Hopefully, we'll be on schedule when I'm done with this real quick. Um, yeah, I'm not a dedicated build engineer. Um, probably like most of you, it's one of those things that I do because I thought it was cool, and now everybody requires it. Uh, I've been using continuous integration since cruise control about 11 years ago. Uh, moved to Hudson after I view a session at a Java One uh, conference by Kosuke and decided that instead of manually maintaining 15 to 20 XML files, this was a much better way to do it. Uh, then migrated to Jenkins. Um, so here's the problem statement and <clears throat> the reason for this presentation today. Um, in, this, in the out of the box uh, parameterized build, when you, when you want to collect information from users prior to running a build, um, such as git branches, notes, uh, we have uh, bug issues, numbers, whatever you want to collect, um, once you do that, it's gone, uh, unless you have a report to run on that. So uh, the only historical reference, and this is what project managers like, is in a report. In fact, the title of this presentation, hey, what did we just release, is a direct quote from one of our project managers after we released some software uh, on production. It's like, what's, what, what do we do? Um, so you can't reuse this data easily. Uh, for future builds, to recreate the build, perhaps. So uh, I'm going to show you how I go about using Jenkins, Groovy, and some Neo4j to uh, persist this data. So out of the box, um, if, and this is only really if you fail a build the first time, uh, will you get a, a message if you, if you open up the default email notification. Now, if you correct the build, this is... This is the uh, subject of your email. This is what you'll see. Not so much. Can't really tell what's going on with that. Um, using the email ext plugin, which is what we are going to use in the, in the final uh, solution, without modification, this is what a successful build would look like. So you don't necessarily have to fail your build before you get this email. But without modification, it's really not a whole lot better to look at. So. We're going to try to correct that. It's also, when you see the, uh, if you click on that link in the email, it will bring you to the, the correct Jenkins job, uh, build job, but then you'll have to poke around. So you'll, you know, you'll click on parameters, it'll pop up this window, and it will show you what the user entered. Um, but that's not that, that's not that easy to, to find. And you have to be patient. Now, for an example, if you have, you run, a, you run a build, you put a node in, you run a second build on the same project, put in a, a, an issue, you run a third build, some more notes. If you want to see all those notes in one space, you, um, you're going to have to open up each email or each job and then uh, click on parameters if you want to see them. So this would be, well, minimum of probably six clicks. And then you have to try to remember and then maybe copy and paste and... Uh, a hassle. That's, of course, if you are keeping every single build from the history of the project. Administrators, and I like to do this, is like to get rid of some of that old build to clear off space on your server. So, in my opinion, there's a better way to do this. Wouldn't it be nice to receive an email that has this type of formatted content on it? it would have your, uh, your notes delineated Perhaps your bug issues also out there. It's got the, some of the information used to uh, produce the build. The version that I'm displaying is, is the artifactory version number. So you can easily go back and find that tag. Um, the, real, the release tag is something that we produce, which uh, it creates another branch in Git. And so when we want to uh, rebuild this or go back and correct a bug, we can pull the, the correct tag. So this looks good. It also looks good on your mobile device. Just as easy. So you can be remote. Nice build. Hey, he's doing his job. 
Also, wouldn't it be nice to uh, take all of this information that we're collecting and uh, display it and use it in this spiffy little interface here? Now, this is something we are using in production. Um, to, as you can see, those tags are what we produce, and each one of those tags is a Git branch. Um, the green and red balls over there indicate uh, it was released to staging or released to production. So clicking on one of these, you will be able to see all of the information that, um, and properties that were used to create that build. So we could go back, populate all these properties, and actually rerun that build next year if we wanted to. That's how it's done. You can, you can tell what I do when I'm coding late nights and sitting on the couch watching reruns that I've seen 20 times. And I know when the punchlines are coming, so I just look up, laugh a little bit, and go back to coding. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. So for this particular uh, test, this, these are the components that I'm using. I'm using Git, Groovy, Gradle, and Artifactory, and their associated Jenkins plugins. And I'm also using Neo4j as the database, and um, a lot of user plugins. The, the important one of which here is the email ext plugin, because that's what's going to format and deliver our email. So why am I using Neo4j? I started this project um, using MySQL. We only, it, was, it was just a pet project. I was running it for myself and, and the project manager who, who asked that infamous question. Um, so I decided, well, maybe we can keep some of this stuff. So I put it in, in MySQL, and um, that was okay for a while. But then other people started seeing it, and they said they want it, but their builds don't run. And, and I was running Maven at the time. Their builds were running an Ant build. There was, um, I think there was another Gradle build, more Maven builds. And so all of these had specific requirements to, to run the build, and so I found myself after a while adding columns and just for a specific build, and I, and I don't really like the way that worked out. You end up with kind of a sloppy database, sparse cells, um, and it's just not that easy to query. So I started looking at a lot of NoSQL solutions, and seeing as how I'm familiar with uh, the JVM, I decided to give Neo4j a look, and I haven't really been sorry with it at all. It's, um, it's really quite, it's quite simple to implement and use. So I'm not going to give a tutorial on Neo4j, but I will give a few highlights um, of, how we're, of how we're using it here. And I'm by no means an expert at Neo4j, but it just shows you how easy it is to use. So you can just pop it up and create an application with it. So it's open source. Um, the tables and columns and rows are all uh, replaced by nodes and relationships. So nodes are used to represent entities, and you would liken that to a table, and the relationships would be um, joins, I suspect. So for this test, um, this is the base model that I'm using, and this is it's really simplified. There, there's, there's more to it, but for this, for this particular um, demonstration, this is what I'm using. The main node would be the build node, obviously. That's what Jenkins is going to produce um, and store once the successful build is run. The sub-project contains most of the information that it's going to use to produce the build. And then there's some other uh, nodes that, that uh, have common commonality across projects, no matter what type of build you're really running. So as an example, um, the sub-project node will contain these properties. And you can have any number of properties and you can name them anything you want on any particular node. So a sub-project node for project A um, might have all of these, whereas a sub-project node for project B would have maybe four of these and three different ones. And it, for Neo4j, it doesn't really matter. So these are some of the properties. And you can see the sub-project is going to have the artifact ID on it. And that's the artifact ex um, extension, and that's how we're going to pull that artifact back out of Artifactory and save it there. The uh, Git repo that we're downloading, some build tasks, whatever you really want. The context is actually used for deploying to Tomcat. 
So the query language that we're going to be running with uh, Neo4j is called Cypher. Um, you can, you, you can um, run queries interactively. You, uh, there's a built-in web interface uh, that uses REST on the back end, I suspect. Or you can use uh, the REST API, which is what we will be using from our Groovy script. Um, it's very similar-esque to SQL. Um, you can use such clauses as match. Uh, I think I would uh, uh, liken this one to a select. Uh, where, order, by, we all know those. And return, well, would be the properties in your select statement. So as an example, here's an example cipher query. Uh, this, that I would, you would run this pretty much on the, uh, the uh, UI, which I will show you in a minute. So we're going to match the project. So we're going to pull out that project name. And, and we do this because we have a project that has 50 or 60 subprojects. The master project uh, has 50 or 60 subprojects. And so we, we really want to group them that way. And you can see all those properties that I just showed you on the previous slide. Uh, we're just going to add those properties just like this. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of JSON-esque in there. And then on the bottom line is we're going to create a relationship between that project and the subproject. So if you open up the web interface, uh, which is default on port 7474, all right, and this is just as available once you in install your um, neo 4 j uh, you can execute your queries interactively, as you can see on the top line there. That would be a query. So, so for this query that we just wrote and ran here, this, if you were to query for the um, subproject, and basically right now this assumes an empty database because we're querying all subprojects uh, with, all, with all projects. So, but there's only one in there. This is what the UI would display. You have one project and one subproject. And really, this was a selling point for me because it's kind of nice to look at. As opposed to a, a MySQL text-based uh, query. Also, if there's a there's a there's a little toggle button down in the corner you can't see here, but if you click that, you can also see the underlying data. In fact, you can see the toggle buttons on the bottom. You can see the data behind those two uh, nodes, which is convenient when you're troubleshooting things. So. This would, is what the uh, graphic would look like after our Jenkins build has inserted the data. You see the, uh, the center item, number 71, is the build node and all of the other nodes that are attached with the relationships. So the query that you see here is you're matching the build node. Empty brackets indicate all relationships. Um, and the N in parentheses without any kind of qualifiers would be all the nodes. So this would be after one build of the same subproject. Now, if we ran a second one, the graph would look like this. It's really pretty interesting. It's, a, it's another interesting way of looking at your data. So you can see here that the common nodes for this particular uh, query would be the user, which would be me, Bob M. And I, apparently, I ran both builds. Um, on the same host um, and the same server or subproject. And then all the other properties are a little bit different. The tag's going to be different because it's a different build. Uh, the properties will be different. It's a different artifactory version, et cetera. So how would we do this query in Groovy? Um, that's what we're boiling down to. Really, all you're going to do is just create a, a Groovy string. And I think, I mean, it would be the same in Java. You just create a string or a string buffer, however you want to do it. Uh, here we're just creating that same query. Uh, this is actually, it's not the same query. This is the Jenkins query that's going to create the build node with all of the extra information. So we're going to use variable substitution, and it's going to put in uh, the versions, the users, and all that other information. And it will return that return statement on the bottom will return the unique ID of the build node. In the case of the last example, would be like number 71, if we want to use that in further processing. So what we, we take this string, 
and we pass it to uh, a REST client. And we just create this REST client in Groovy. It's, it's very simple to do. You can see from the, from the URL 7474 and DB data cipher, but all that can be configurable. That's just uh, the default. Um, we set the headers to accept uh, and send JSON. And then we just uh, send our JSON uh, string, formatted string, to the server, and it returns the results. And that's how we, you run a query. The hard part about it is, and I didn't show this, is parsing the, parsing the result set, because it sends back a ton of information. It sends back the relationship points. and So really, you have to do some uh, JSON parsing when you get it back, um, which is why in the, I think in a, after this, I'm going to inspect spring data and see if they can make that task a little bit easier, because they do have a spring data module for Neo4j. All right, let's see how this works. So you've got your parameterized build, and you're going to add whatever information you want. Uh, for this, for this uh, example, it's going to be just a git branch and uh, some notes that the user is going to enter. Again, like I say, we, use, we also put uh, issues in there. We happen to use fog bugs for reasons beyond my control. Um, but what the Groovy script will do for that is it'll take the, uh, the number of the issue, it'll go out, because there's a REST API, and it'll go out and query for the description of whatever that bug is. And so when the report is done, if you know, you've run the build 25, 30 times, there may be 15, 20 b different bug issues. You don't want to display the number. That's not going to help those people, because then they have to manually go look at the number. So what we do on our final builds is we get the number, we take a description, and we map that as a URL back to the page. So when they click on it, it opens up the issue in, in, in the system itself. They like that. As a, throwaway, as a throwaway project, it keeps me more busy than I would have liked. All right, so we'll set up Git. Uh, I'm using Git. I mean, any source code uh, repository will do. Um, in the branches, I'm just going to um, put the git branch because whatever they enter in there, and then I think it defaults to master or development or whatever your system uses. Uh, but if we're running specialized tests, which I like to do a lot, um, this will keep it straight. You replace that. Now, in, in this, um, yeah, yeah, we're also going to check it out to a subdirectory, and I'm going to call that, usually I just call it the name of whatever the project is, because I'm going to also be checking out the groovy code that we'll be running from Jenkins. That's also under source control. So we want to keep those two projects separated. Um, for that, actually, I do sometimes use the multi-build plugin, which it functions rather well. So we'll inject some environment variables into the build process. Really, what I want to do is, is tell the, you know, define the name of the properties file without having to type it out all the time and then the location of the Groovy scripts, because this is what we're going to pass to the Groovy plugin. Inject some passwords, you know, unless, unless your databases are unprotected, which no, I'm not judging. Um, you know, we pass things like this, because if I were to put those, and I'm sure you are aware of this, if I were to put the passwords here, while even if you are the only one to be able to uh, modify the script. Um, if there's an error, the error log will display the value of that. We don't really want that. So here's the database password. Some build steps. Now the first, th the first step I'm going to take is I'm going to execute a shell command that is going to take these properties that we've, the users entered and that we've defined, and I'm going to write them out to a, our, our own properties file. And the reason I'm going to do that is because the, the Groovy script itself will read those properties back in and then use them to, to do further processing. So the application, which here is hard-coded um, in, in the project I told you where we have 25 to 30, the project is listed in a drop-down list, and so they select that. That's populated here, and that's also passed to the script. So we have the same set of scripts running for those 30 to 40, 50, keeps growing every week, um, applications. So I don't really have to do too much 
you know, I don't have 50 separate scripts for 50 different projects. I use the same set of scripts and just pass the variables. Here's a bigger, if you couldn't see that, here's a bigger one. Now that said statement in there, I mean, since I'm, using, I'm running this on Linux, it's, it's easy to do these things. Um, all, that's, all that's doing is replacing, because the notes really can be multiple lines, you know, one note per line. It's removing the new line and separating them with a tilde character, and this just makes it easier to put onto the properties line and easier to read in. So now that we have those that we've defined, we want to get the, the parameters that Jenkins defines. And this includes who's running the build, um, the email address uh, based on the user. Now, these are not all the ones. These are the ones I'm, I'm interested in right now. There's a, there's a big list of properties that, that they maintain. So there's the export job runtime parameters plugin, or, or something, something like that. Um, and it exports these values to a file named HudsonBuild.properties. Don't know why they didn't change it to JenkinsBuild.properties, but it's still HudsonBuild.properties. So the uh, external Groovy script will also read these properties in and make use of them. So after we've done all this, we've we've uh, checked out we've checked out our code, we've checked out the Groovy scripts, and we've created our properties. This is what your workspace looks like, and now we're ready to start. This is preliminary work. So we can call it, we can execute the Groovy script. Um, we have the Groovy script plugin, and so we enter in the name of the script that we're going to run. Um, there's, there's a space on there for some parameters. So we're gonna run it twice. The first time, it's called, called pre-build, and it'll be run prior to the Gradle build. Second time, post-build, um, after a successful build. Now the first, the first one, the pre-build, in fact, here's, Here's the uh, Groovy script. You can see I'm passing it the name of the prop file and the, the uh, indicator of pre-build plus the uh, database information. So it's, the, the script itself is uh, juc.groovy is going to load the properties file. It's going to query the database using the information in that properties file, such as the uh, project name. Um, and it's going to append the database values back to that same file as new properties. So after the pre-build, you see we have a lot more properties. And most of these have come from the Neo4j database. Now the build number, that's, that's from Hudson build properties. All those builds, underscores, come from that Hudson build properties file. But the uh, things such as the artifact ID, artifact reversion, all that information, that comes from the um, comes from the database that we've queried in that same manner using Groovy and the REST API. So the next step is to take that properties file that we just appended to and read it back into Jenkins so that it can make use of those brand new variables. And that's achieved with the inject environment variables plugin. And it works fine. It's what it does. It just brings it back in. And now Jenkins is aware of everything that was in that properties file. And it um, overwrites everything that was there before. Now we're ready to run the, the Gradle build. This is just uh, this is the easy part. You can see we're populating the tasks and the project directory since, um, since this is built, it's a Gradle project built with subprojects. We want to know where to find our particular project. So we're, so we're putting those in. And these were, these, this information was retrieved from the database, which is why it's run in the pre-build. So assuming this build runs perfectly, and there are no errors, uh, we will run the post-build script. The post-build script will do more. Um, A, it'll start off loading the properties file in again, because between invocations, it's, all this information is lost. Um, It'll get the artifact information. It gets this from the uh, build.gradle file, just uh, some text parsing. It'll create the unique tag name. This tag name is what's going to be used to save this, this build branch, the, the code branch, so, so we can reproduce this branch later. Um, aggregate notes, this is, and this is the important part of this talk, 
it's going to aggregate notes from previous builds. So since it's saved it in Neo4j, now we're going to retrieve uh, the notes from the previous builds. And the way I aggregate them for my projects is I do it on a subproject version basis. So once we roll over and we release a version, um, I start the notes again in, in the uh, uh, bug issues from scratch. So the first build after release will have only whatever they put in for that one instead of the rolling history. Uh, it will create some HTML elements that used in a report. Uh, and, and, and this is because we're, we're going to be doing some looping through the notes, et cetera. And that's, I don't even know if that's even achievable in the email plugin. So this is creating uh, just a string of list, HTML list elements. Uh, create and push the new branch of Git using this tag name that we uh, created and append these new properties, such as the group ID and the version, back into that properties file, and which we'll once again read that in the, the same way we did before. And then it's done up to that point. Now, for the good stuff. So once your Gradle build's done, uh, your artifacts are deployed, uh, your Groovy scripts are done, we're not going to be using those anymore. Uh, we still need to do some stuff. Now, uh, depending on where we're deploying to, uh, we have an integration, we have a staging, we have a QA, different sets of servers. Um, and, and, and it knows of this because those are, those are contained in, in the information. Uh, we're going to deploy it to Tomcat via Jenkins. Uh, then we're going to send the email. If it's a web app, of course. If it's a jar file, we just continue on our way. If it's uh, Ruby or whatever else we're running. We'll do something different. Now, for this, for this demo, I'm using the deploy plugin. However, in practice, and I, I do not use this plugin because unless they've updated it recently, in the past, it does not, um, it does not recognize the environment variables. So you can't, you, you would have to put in um, the name of the, con you know, the context path. All this information would need to be hard-coded, so then I would need one, one Jenkins job per, per sub-project. Um, for this, I, I used this because it was simple for this. However, now in practice, this is how I, this is how I do it. This, um, since I'm using, again, since I'm using Linux, I'm just using a curl command to access the Tomcat manager and uh, list deploy, undeploy the applications. It's a, it's a pretty simple um, string. So that, that makes, that's another reason I can just use one Jenkins job for 50 sub-project jobs. Sorry, did you need that back? <laughs> did you catch that? <laughs> so here, here's the uh, piece de resistance, uh, the email report delivered to a list of interested recipients, most likely your project managers, but perhaps uh, ancillary developers who might be interested in that. Um, I'm using the email ext plugin because it, it can also use these environment variables. Uh, they're, they're formatted in a funky way, but they work just fine. Um, so I'm using the HTML content type so I can produce HTML. Um, and you can include CSS in there to format your report. Um, yeah, you can populate using the grid. So the properties that we import are now being passed into the email report. So here's an example of what it would look like. The content type is HTML. I think there's also text, just regular text. Uh, you can see those uh, little dollar sign EMV comma var equals. That is how this plugin uh, uses environment variables. <coughs> so those will be replaced, excuse me, those will be replaced with the properties uh, from the database. And then below, is just some default content, um, irrespective of whether this was a successful build or a failure. But this is just um, basic information. So if it's a successful build, we will add a little more information, um, such as, you know, we've deployed it here. We're going to give you the URL to that particular page. Uh, we'll include all the notes on there. You can include those up above. We chose not to. You can really format these things however you want. So a demonstration, and let's hope this works. Let's see what I can do about this.
Okay. Well, now we're back to our technical difficulties because you should be seeing my Jenkins. Let's see what he can do this here. He that will just blow the whole thing away. Oh, yeah, let's keep that. Okay. Well, it's, it looks weird, but it'll work. All right. So. First of all, uh, let's check Neo4j, and I think I've zeroed everything out here. So here, here is just the default um, out of the box Neo4j. You just get this welcome screen. Uh, we can get rid of that. And uh, here's the query. So we're going to try to find all the builds that are in the database for now. It should come back with nothing, as it does. Excellent. All right. So now we'll go. We'll run our job. If I can find it, oh, there they are. We'll just run one job here. Build it with parameters. Odd structure. Uh, I'm using the Git branch for this particular test, so we'll leave that. We'll just we'll put in a note. Note number one. Note number two. And we'll run the build, and it should be rather quick. Uh, so hopefully, it, it's supposed to send it to me to my own email. We'll see if it works. You never know on these demos. It may not have connected. Oh, I said it did. Okay, as you can see from for some of these um, log items, uh, we created that new branch from JUC Hello World with the version number and the build number, and that is our tag. That's going to be our new branch. Let's see if I got that email. There it is. You can see that our notes are note number one and note number two. Um, now if I click on the link, it should take me to this wonderful program that I've written for this called Hello World. So the, the key point is it deployed the application and gave, you, gave the um, recipients a link to it so they can immediately see what was changed, and assuming there were other things in there. So it's part two of this. Let's go to, let's change the, um, all right, we'll just go hello world from JUC. There. And we'll commit this. that, and we'll rerun the job. And we'll just, let's see, we'll just put in another note, uh, updated text. Let's build it. Can't get used to this resolution. Publishing it out. Created a new tag, as you can see, with the build number in there, number six. Sent myself another email. And we'll take a look at this one. Um, yeah. As you can see, um, it's, got, it's got the notes from the first build in there with the brand new one with the associated build numbers. And clicking the link, we now have the new text in the new application. So, that seemed to be okay. Back to here. And are there any questions? I guess I can't get the, hang on, let me get this there. Questions. <laughs> I don't want to mess with the technical difficulty part of this again. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is, have we ever tried to analyze the data from the, from the graph database itself? And yeah, we do. I do a little bit of that myself as far as consistency goes. But we mostly have the QA people analyzing it for whatever trends that they might see in there. Um, 
I, looked, I, I do analyze it a bit to see if there's any redundancies, um, how properties could be combined, and, and that sort of thing. But seeing as how it's a you know, graph database, and the, and the queries that I showed you are, are really very basic. You can get down there, and you can, you can really do some, some fast analysis with the graph database. You don't have that kind of you know, multiple join query overhead that you get with uh, MySQL, especially if, especially if, um, if you're querying on lots of different properties. Yes. Right, the question is, I believe, um, since we're using Artifactory, have we tried to uh, integrate, do, do some more Jenkins to Artifactory integration as far as saving some of the properties to Artifactory um, and, and saving their build results and properties, am, am I correct? Uh, we started to do that a little bit, but uh, I, don't, I didn't really see that it was fitting my needs at the time. And, and, it's, and it's a good way to go. However, um, querying Artifactory in the same way that you would query the NERIC for J is not quite as efficient. It, it, would, be used in, it would be used differently, um, in, in my opinion. I, I would use that a different way. Plus, and the way we're, we're getting to the Artifactory here um, is we're just also using its REST API from Groovy. So we're doing that. Yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah, the question is, does every build create a release node? And I have, I have every successful build create a release node. Um, I, don't, I don't really have the need to say failed builds because that's going to manifest itself. The failed build, however, will send a, the s similar email. The, um, in the email ext plugin, there's a section for the success, which I showed you. There's also a section um, for failed builds. So if your build fails, what I'm doing then is I'm including that top half information, and then I'm including the build log uh, along with that. But I don't save nodes. I mean, you could. I mean, you, you know, really, you can save whatever. The information that I'm presenting here is what's uh, currently of interest to me in, in our projects. I'm sure others will, will vary. You know, everybody has different needs. But, but in that token, I find Neo4j to be very good at that because it doesn't really care so much about the structure of your data. You know, um, if you need to add another node, you add one. If you need another property on that node that's not on any other one, you just put it in there. Um, and then you can query for it. And if it doesn't find it, it won't return that. So, yes, sir? How many times a day do you build? How many times a day do we build? Well, it would depend on the project. Um, uh, this particular one that I, I'm using this on has 50 sub-projects. I would estimate each one of those 50, well, I can't estimate each one of them because they're in different states of development. Some are, some are released and not being too worked on. But I would, I would estimate there are, on average, 15 to 20 builds a day. Now, I also have on my production Jenkins screen um, a checkbox where if they just want to run it and deploy it and test it, they don't necessarily need to create you know, the release node. So that's an option. I don't, I don't create one every single time. They have the option not to do that. And if they just want to test a quick change without you know, logging it anywhere. So, and for things like that, they don't add notes anyway. So, right. The, the question is, have we tried to pull in Git commit messages um, into, into our database, and we have not done this yet, but it's, it's an excellent point. Um, the only reason we haven't done it is because I'm really the only one that works on it, and I just haven't found the time, to be honest with you. But that's, that's an excellent point, because that would be something that I would send yet a different, I, you, and you can send multiple emails, so I would send a secondary set of emails, which would be another project of mine, containing the git commits that were in this particular build, and then historical since the last release, I suspect. But yes, it can, and that can be done. You could do that in the Groovy script as well. I mean, it would just go out and run your git commands, pull in your uh, history logs, format it however you want, save them. I don't know. You could either have it be a node or properties, however you want to do that. Well, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>